Hello everybody, welcome to the impact estimation video in the large scale machine learning section of ML Expert. Now, in the previous videos, we talked about experiments. We talked about the different ways to run the experiments. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to estimate the impact of these experiments before we actually run them and after we run them. One of the first things to consider when asking is it worth experimenting is how much will it cost? So we have to measure cost in time, expect at least a minimum of two weeks to actually run the experiment. Two weeks is often used as a way to cover more than one weekend and more than one business week. This is often a healthy minimum. Let's say that we were running a recommendation algorithm for some particular product page. We want to give customers time to potentially return their items as well as purchase them. This will be helpful in the case where even if purchases did go up, if returns of those purchases also went up, then we want to incorporate that as well. And now in terms of preparing for the experiment, I would set aside at least two weeks to two months. For larger companies, this could even get into three or four months. Basically, we need to cover the training data collection, which we've talked about in this video series. We have to create the actual model, which we'll talk about soon. We have to have some experiment infrastructure, which we've talked about in the past. We have to determine how we want to serve these predictions from our model. And lastly, we have to perform a post-experiment analysis, which we'll talk about later in this video. Now, beyond just time, we need to figure out how many people we need to run the experiment. Now, this is assuming that all of these people are ML experts, is usually at a minimum three for small to medium-sized companies. And it's usually a software engineer, a data engineer, and a data scientist. Now, if you're working at a very early stage startup, it is possible to have an experiment run with a single person's effort. Next up, we need to consider the opportunity cost. So first up, there could be other non-machine learning projects. I don't often like to admit that there are other projects out there except machine learning projects. But in general, you may notice that these machine learning algorithms that we're talking about usually involve some form of optimization. So if we already have a business set up, machine learning will typically come in and help these businesses optimize either more customers, more revenue, or more cost savings, things like that. So given the opportunity to potentially create additional streams of revenue for the business, that could be more attractive than creating some sort of ML experiment, which would just optimize a currently existing business model. Let's say that we do want to pursue an ML experiment or project, then we have to evaluate what other areas of the business could use ML, and if those areas would benefit more from ML than whatever we're considering right now. Basically, all of these things together will result in some dollar amount. Now, this doesn't have to be extremely precise. If you're at a small to medium company, maybe use units of 100,000 or millions. If you're at a larger company, think in order of multiple millions. Now, this number should be used pretty generally, just so that people understand that running an experiment isn't free. So now that we understand approximately how much something could cost, now we want to know the potential upside or the benefit to the company or customer experience. What I often do is pretend that we build the perfect model. So let's say that we build a machine learning model which gets us a 100% click-through probability, a 100% sign-up rate, or zero cancellations. What would that look like in terms of our revenue and profit if we took a small fraction of that perfect model result. So I often take a 1% cut of that, a 2%, 5%, and 10% cut of that perfect result, and then I make sure to relate that to some revenue or profit. As an example, let's say that we have 1,000 daily visitors to a website, and let's say that we have a 3% sign-up rate on average. Let's say our revenue per sign up is $50 a sign up. So right now, every single day, the max, if we have a perfect model that gets us 100% sign up rate, the max we'd ever be able to make is $50,000 a day. Now we're already at 3%, which is $1,500 a day. What if our model could get us a 2% lift? Well, that would bring us an additional $1,000 a day, which is $365,000 a year, with a 70% profit margin, that's about a quarter million in net profit that we would get every year if we could get a 2% lift in signup rate. Now, even though we used signup rate, we made sure to relay that in terms of revenue and profit. So if you're speaking in only terms of signups or cancellations or session time, it becomes more and more difficult to make clear decisions about when to and when not to experiment. If, however, you relate it in terms of monetary value, such as revenue and profit, 
it levels the playing field so you can compare different opportunities equally. Now, it's not to say that looking at screen time or listening time, things like that, aren't important. It's just when we're making these decisions, we should make sure to clearly relay them to some numerical value which we can compare across different opportunities. Speaking of comparing, we want to compare the cost of the experimentation to the potential upside. So let's say that we need about $100,000 to run the experiment. Maybe this would mean three people on a project for two months and some fixed hardware cost for the entire project lifetime. So let's say that number landed at 100,000 and let's say that if we get a 2% lift, we would have a $200,000 potential upside. Now typically I like to go a little bit more conservative, so maybe this 200 is actually 250, but I like to trim some off the top just to be conservative. So given this opportunity here to basically double our money in two months, because we have to spend $100,000 and then we get $200,000 in two months, assuming everything goes correctly. If we could do this every two months throughout the entire year, we would get a 600% return on that $100,000. Now, 600% on this original investment may sound quite high, but generally I like to stick to the 10 times rule. So here, that would mean maybe reducing the amount of time required for the experiment from two months to one month. That would annualize our return to 1,200%, which would be 12x. That would meet that rule. We could also perhaps take someone off the project and have only two people working on it. That could increase the rate of return there. Additionally, we could go through with a project and be able to leverage whatever we build for future experiments such that on average, we still get that 10x rule. The reason I like the 10x rule is even if only 20% of the things that you plan on doing go according to plan, you will still double your original investment within the year. This has proven to me at least to be relatively safe. Finally, one thing to think about is the point of diminished return. I always like to say that 20% of the effort will get you 80% of the way there. The last 20% of getting to that finish line will take 80% of your effort. This is generally true with machine learning. You can often get 80% of the results that you're looking for with very simple models. If you want that remaining 20% of the result, you typically have to invest in far more complex models, which often take a lot more effort. So often it's a good idea to go in with this mindset such that you can implement ML in other areas of the business that haven't yet hit the point of diminished returns. So now that we have how much the experiment will cost and potentially how much the experiment could benefit us, Next, we want to know what are the risks to the business from this experiment. The obvious risk could be some loss to a metric that you care about. This could be click-through probability, conversions, session time, and even customer familiarity and trust. So for instance, let's say that we were running an experiment in which we updated the style of our push notifications. Some customers may really like that that push notification details the most popular posts. Now let's say we end up changing that based on the results of our experiment. The customers will have to regain familiarity with how they interact with your product. Finally, we want to look at customer trust here, and customer trust could be at risk in terms of data leakage. So let's say that you've been running your app or website or business for some time, and you haven't been collecting data that would be required to run machine learning models. If you want to run an experiment, you now have to begin collecting data about your customers, and some of this data could be confidential. Once you're storing this confidential data, there's always a risk of a data leakage. So you have to implement different security measures around the way you store the data to make sure that you can safely experiment. Next up, any time that we introduce new components or we change different software components in our software system that backs the business, we risk a potential outage. Lastly, before we run the experiment, we want to know how quickly can we stop the experiment. This is hugely important in the case where you're experimenting with a significant portion of your business model. If you think it's going to take an entire day to revert the experimentation to whatever core experience you used to have, that may mean that you can't experiment until you can get that transition down to maybe a few minutes. So these right here are just about the scariest parts of experimenting. And one risk on here that's not included is the risk of not experimenting. Time has told us that the companies that are willing to experiment and adjust their business models are often the ones that last. So yes, these are a lot of risks, and there are things we can do to mitigate the risk, which we'll talk about, but in general, we should compare these to the risk of your business potentially becoming irrelevant. 
So how do we mitigate some of these? Well, we can do what's called a shadow test. With this, we'll try to get some understanding of how the new experiences behave. So let's say that we have a service here, some app, and a user calls the app to get the home page. What we'll do is we'll have the old experiment running to get some recommendation from whatever the old recommendation algorithm is. At the same time, we'll call the new experience, which will get some updated recommendation algorithm. And we will log both of the results of these experiences, but we'll send the old experience to the user. What this allows us to do is take those new experience logs and those old experience logs and use them to sanity check to make sure that it's recommending something that's actually somewhat understandable. We can measure the differences between them, so we'll know how big the impact is of this new change compared to the old change. So let's say that the new recommendation algorithm only differs from the old recommendation algorithm, say 5% of the time. This gives you some confidence in how different your customer experience will be. Additionally, since we're now calling our new experience with real live customer traffic and data, we can find errors and faults that we may have not caught during testing. Lastly, we'll be able to understand how these new software components affect different areas of the compute resources. So for instance, we'll be able to tell what happened to the CPU, memory, disk, and even what happened to the latency given this new experience. That's going to cover everything from the pre-experiment. Now let's move on to the post-experiment. One question we'll want to ask is, are these experiment results valid? One thing we'll have to do to answer this question is correct for bias. Sample selection bias happens when different users were placed in some particular group and that user had a predisposition to behave a certain way regardless of the group they were in. Now for an example of sample selection bias, we can revisit the example experiment where we were changing the push notifications that we sent to users. Let's say the results came in from the experiment and it appeared that treatment B was far better than the control experience A. However, looking past the click-through probabilities, it was found that, on average, the users sent to group B were more likely, based on historical data, to click the push notification anyway. This would be a case where we would have to correct for the bias in which these customers were already more likely to click those push notifications. Now, the next thing that we'd like to do is to make sure that our results that we obtained from our experiment are extrapolation appropriate. So if we did this experiment on a holiday or a payday or some season like the beginning of school, then this could mean that our experiments are maybe valid, but maybe not valid enough to extrapolate them for the rest of the year. Generally, if you are going to do something around a holiday, it's good to look at the comparisons of the previous year and adjust for the normally expected growth. So if your company's growing at 5%, and comparatively to last year, you're 5% up, then that really means that nothing changed because on average you've been growing 5% without this new experience. Next up, we want to make sure that the results are statistically valid. We've talked about this in previous videos. For frequentist A-B testers, this will be the p-values. For Bayesian A-B testers, this will be the probability of B greater than A and incorporating some form of expected loss. For multi-arm bandits, we'll make sure that the value remaining was sufficiently low. Finally, something that's overlooked pretty often are experiment collisions. So was another experiment being done such that it would impact a similar user experience, or even if the user experience was different, would it impact the same metrics? It's very important to make sure that there are no experiment collisions so that your experiment results alone can be trusted. Another thing that we have to think about is something called carryover effects. So let's say that a sale on an item just concluded, and maybe a week later, our updated algorithm that we're experimenting with just happened to recommend that item a lot more. Well, it's likely that that item that we're now recommending will not be bought at a normal price because the sale a week earlier had just ended and had a lot lower pricing option. At this point, it could look like your updated recommendation algorithm is unsuccessful, but maybe if you waited a few weeks, you would get a different behavior. This is something called a carryover effect. So now that we can confirm whether or not the experiment result is valid, we can now ask if the experience is worth launching. So by this, we really want to look at the variance and invariance that we talked about in our hypothesis. 
We reviewed variance and invariance earlier in the video series. Some questions we can ask is did the variance we expected to change actually change? Did any invariance change? And do any of the changes in the variance contradict? For instance, let's say that the session time for the app was up per user, while the ad revenue actually went down a little bit. This could mean, perhaps, that the new experience is recommending that users go to non-monetized pages within your app. So in general, you want to make sure that you understand exactly what's changing, what's not, and how these things are changing together. Another nice thing to look at post-experiment is if the customer service metrics changed at all. So were there spikes in the number of calls or number of emails or messages to your customer support team? This can sometimes indicate some sort of confusion with the new experience or dissatisfaction. Next up, did any cannibalization occur? This can happen when a new algorithm that we have pushes or recommends one product over another product, and this can have unforeseen implications to the other product such that now the other product is not selling as much. So even if sales for a particular item went up, it could have impacted the sales negatively of another item. So if we did everything in the pre-experiment and now we're comfortable with everything post-experiment wise, then this is most likely an indication that we can launch. This wraps up the impact estimation video in the large scale machine learning section of ML Expert. Thanks for joining and we'll see you next time.